appreciate that introduction to let us get to know you a little better. I'm going to start with health insurance costs as a topic here. Costs are increasing and set to increase with open enrollment coming up here by double digit percentages next year. In most, if not all of the states, we're talking about the individual market specifically. In asking questions from our listeners, Sherry wrote us to tell us that one of her daughters has a $7,000 deductible. In Minnesota, the individual market is 5% of all insurance purchasers, which includes a few hundred thousand Minnesotans who are farmers, small business employees, and owners, and those who are self-employed, and others. What federal proposals do you support to address these rising health insurance costs, specifically on the individual market? Angie Craig. Yeah, well, I've, I've said uh, from the start that the Affordable Care Act has not done enough quite yet to control the cost of health care. Uh, for the individual marketplace in Minnesota, there are a number of different things that the state can decide they want to do, like a reinsurance market, uh, combining the group and the individual marketplace. But you're absolutely right, Tom, and uh, your listener is, that the uh, idea that health care costs in the individual marketplace, despite the fact that we now have an uninsured rate in Minnesota of about 4.3 percent, is absolutely unacceptable. So at the federal level, I really think that we've got to dig in and start figuring out how we control the cost of health care. The first thing that I would do the, uh, with Medicaid, with the VA, the government negotiates. Uh, with Medicare, it's a $300 billion cost to this country, and they are expressly prohibited from negotiating for Medicare Part D prescription drugs. Uh, I think that we've got to uh, also move toward high-value care in this country. Mayo is such a perfect example of this. It's estimated that if this nation could uh, even remotely move toward the efficiency levels and high value uh, health care that we see and quality health care that we see in Minnesota at Mayo, uh, that we could save $50 billion in this country over five years. And, you know, the problem is, yeah, we have a health care cost problem. Jason wants, his only solution really is to create an access problem by repealing the Affordable Care Act and leaving 20 million people uh, off of coverage, and he's got absolutely no plan to replace it. Let me uh, take that to you there, Jason. That is the, the one of the big questions here with sure. Obamacare is repeal it or fix it. Are you in favor of repealing it? Well, I'm repealing and replacing, uh, reforming it. I mean, you know, you, the only people left supporting Obamacare now are Nancy Pelosi, who's been raising money for Angie, uh, and Angie Craig, who said that didn't go far enough. She wants to expand the Affordable Care Act. This is an unmitigated disaster. Don't ask me. Just ask Bill Clinton or Mark Dayton. you got got 100,000 people in outstate Minnesota that are going to be shoved into a plan Plan that they didn't choose. Very high deductibles, very high co-pays, very strict drug formularies, and very high premiums. Some of us predicted this uh, five, six, seven years ago uh, when this thing went in. When you mandate the highest cost insurance, which the Obamacare mandates did, and you mandate a community rating system, you price young people out of the market. We've got to remove those onerous mandates. We've got to reinstall high-risk pools. There were 35 high-risk pools in the country before the Affordable Care Act. They were wiped out by the ACA and Obamacare. Those who were working, especially MCHA in Minnesota, just fine. You have a guaranteed renewable law in Minnesota that if you buy insurance and you pay your premiums, they cannot drop you. I'm in total favor of that at the, at the federal level. And I would reform the tax code. One of the things that is really hitting people hard, and I know from personal experience, because I've been on the individual policy now for five years and my premiums have tripled, I've gone through three insurers. So it's hit the Lewis family, my wife and two daughters, pretty hard. So one of the things you can do is go back to that, that deductibility for out-of-pocket payments. The Affordable Care Act, what Angie supports and wants to expand, took away the ability to deduct your out-of-pocket payments. It used to be 7.5% of income, now it's 10% of income. So if you're a, a couple of teachers making $40,000 a year, you're making $80,000 in joint income, you have to have out-of-pocket costs of $8,000 before you can deduct them. I would change the tax code so you can deduct all of your out-of-pocket payments. You mentioned high-risk pools. Minnesota had one there not allowed under the Affordable Care Act, so the policy, what, is to just re-allow them? Yeah, you would, you would do that for a safety net. 
uh, for people that literally can't get coverage. But if you reform the code so that you have affordability and portability, so people can actually get the kind of coverage they want and take it from job to job instead of relying on employer-based coverage all the time, understand, you know, this is not just an issue for the individual market. You've got a healthcare premiums going way up for small business and employers, and they are cutting back on benefits and dropping people too. So I would argue that it's a problem for the employer-based uh, insured too. Uh, Angie, Craig, as you've seen, there are some ads out there that have a quote in there about expanding the Affordable Care Act. You've said that's out of context in what way? Well, removing the mandates, as Jason suggested, and changing the tax code is just sort of a conservative talk radio's way of saying get rid of the quality controls and eliminate oversight in an industry that already charges Americans too much. So for me, this is really about expanding. Uh, when you talk about expanding access, what you are saying is we already have 4.3 percent uninsured in this state. If we can make it more affordable, if we can actually drive the cost of health care down, I don't want to go back to a time when women paid more than men, when pre-existing condition, conditions prohibited someone from having health insurance, when we couldn't keep our children on our plans until age 26. And so, you know, the portability argument that Jason makes, I know previously he's talked about, you know, let's let just competition take care of this. Let's uh, sell uh, health care across state lines. Well, you know, you buy a plan in Alabama, it's an absolute race to the bottom. And if you want an in-network physician, you got to drive to Alabama. This is exactly what's wrong with this country and our politics is uh, we want to throw the whole thing out and start over when we have absolutely no plan to replace it. Instead of digging in and saying, Jason, let's sit down and let's try to work together to figure out what's working in the Affordable Care Act, where we need to improve. That's all I'm suggesting. What is working in the Affordable Care Act, Jason? Well, look, not much of anything, and that's where Angie is, is, it's kind of surprising, she's doubling down on her support for the Affordable Care Act. Now, I understand Obamacare has been good to you. Angie lobbied to get it passed when she was at her previous job, and then she lobbied <laughs> to get her industry exempt from the Obamacare taxes. That's how the politically connect work in this era. But the, the bottom line is, everybody knows this isn't working. You've got premiums going up 54% last year. 67% this year. Angie talks about everybody being insured. Yeah, everybody's insured and nobody has good health care. That's the result of the Affordable Care Act. We need real reform, and it's not just a matter of tinkering around the edges. It's a matter of replacing this with more care that's affordable so that young people can choose the kind of plan they want, not the kind of plan that Angie thinks they ought to have. Is it that's how a nationwide market works. Is it realistic to think that such a reform can happen and you can keep, or, or do you support keeping things like the pre-existing condition mandate and the, and the, uh, between um, a man and a woman, right, the, the, that you have to charge, you can't charge the, disparate rates? The big problem with the pre-existing condition is most people get their health insurance at work. So you're a, you're a woman and you're working for 30 years and all of a sudden you come down with diabetes. Then tragically you get laid off. Now you're going into the individual market for the first time with a pre-existing condition. And that's where that crisis began. And that's why I think we ought to have tax reform so we can have true portability so that people, people can buy their health insurance but and should, keep it. And Minnesota already has a guaranteed renewable law, which I support. And I would support at the federal level to make certain that the insurance companies can't drop them. But let me, Angie wants to talk about, about compromise and this and that. You know what? If you really want to keep the, the premium subsidy exchanges for people where the cost is too great, that's fine with me. I think if we had a more of a market-based health care plan, fewer people would need that. Now, everybody needs them because the prices are skyrocketing. And the, the cost of the Affordable Care Act, by the way, is not going to be a trillion. It's not going to be two trillion. The administration doesn't even know where it's going. It could be north of three trillion dollars because businesses are laying people off. They don't want to work more than 30 hours because then they have to buy this Cadillac plan. So people are being thrown into the exchanges. The subsidies or costs are going way up. It has been a disaster by everybody's account except Nancy Pelosi and Angie Craig. Well, I think it's the most ironic thing that's happened so far in this race that Republicans are attacking uh, a Democrat for being opposed 
to a business tax. Think about that for a second. 241 Republicans voted uh, to suspend the medical device tax. I absolutely... Which Eric Paulson worked on Which a lot. Eric and Paulson worked on, which Congressman Klein voted to suspend, which Congressman Emmer voted to suspend. 241 Republicans. I'm saying I would have voted with them. Why? Because I saw firsthand in Minnesota that it cost Minnesota jobs. That the Minnesota economy is reliant on one 100,000 members of the medical technology community. So I'm not going to apologize for a minute for fighting against something that I thought was going to harm Minnesota's economy. So you were against it after you were for it? We you fought were, the Because affordable... we wouldn't have had the medical device tax, Angie, if we hadn't had Obamacare in the first place, which I opposed, which means I opposed the medical device tax. Initially, you lobbied for Obamacare, which gave us the medical device tax. Then you lobbied to exempt your industry from that tax. That's exactly what's got people frustrated, this, con- this politically connected insider group. So I was exactly where Senator Amy Klobuchar is. She was working on behalf of the people of Minnesota to access to health care, and at the same time, We didn't think that an excise tax on revenue, keep in mind, an excise tax on revenue hits small businesses. So a small business tax, when you want people reinvesting in R&D to grow their business, you don't want an excise tax on revenue. It was a bad tax. It hurt the Minnesota economy. And yes, Jason, that's the problem with conservative talk radio. It's either (laughs) or. It's not either or. Real life is not either or. No, real real life is opposing the, the Obamacare Act to begin with, which would have stopped the medical device tax. If you'd That's opposed, where I was. If you'd been in Congress and opposed Obamacare and it hadn't happened, though, uh, children wouldn't be on their parents' plan till age 26. You wouldn't have you would have the pre-existing condition problem that you had before. That's right, and, and that's why, as I said a moment ago, we've got to have a wider reform with a pre-existing condition problem. I do think you can solve most of it with guaranteed renewable policies and more affordable policies that can be carried from job to job, so that people don't lose coverage and then have to go out with a pre-existing condition and get it. And I've been talking about that for 10 years, uh, more than that, actually. That's the real kind of reform I'd work for in Congress. Not, not to extend and you know say Obamacare didn't go far enough, as Angie Craig said. Well, Tom, just one point. He's, yeah. I think, mentioned now three times that I'm a political outsider. I know you mentioned I've never run for public office in my life before, and I'm not the one of us who ran for Congress in Colorado previously. You, well, the, and the, the criticism I'm hearing from political ads, and take that for whatever it's worth, is that one of the jobs you had is that you controlled your company's PAC, the Political Action Committee, which meant you did decide which political donations to make, et cetera. So you were in the political realm there. Does that make you an insider? Well, I was on the PAC board. I was the PAC chair along with six other individuals. And quite frankly, I was the only Democrat on that board. And the PAC gave mostly to Republicans. So if you go dig into that PAC, Republicans now are complaining that they got most of the PAC money from St. Jude Medical and now twisting this to be that I'm an insider. Well, actually, you've got more money from your industry than any candidate for Congress, for the Senate, even for the presidency right now. Absolutely. And, 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 These are well, my colleagues. So you, I worked with them for 10 years, Jason. You have been on the did. inside then in we, political donations. These are my Republican friends, by the way, who are supporting me. We are having a conversation, a debate here with the Republican and DFL candidates for the 2nd Congressional District. This is an important race in Minnesota here. It's the South Metro and goes down into Southeast Minnesota. And it's the only seat in Congress in Minnesota of our delegation that's open this year. John Klein is retiring. So Jason Lewis, the Republican nominee, and Angie Craig, the DFL nominee, are with me in the studio here for this hour. I do want to talk about some other topics, although I totally understand why health insurance we could go the whole hour with. It's a very important topic. I'm going to steal from last night's debate, actually, one of the questions, because entitlements is a big issue. What changes would you support to both Social Security and Medicare? Jason, I'll start with you. Well, look, the single best thing we can do for the trust Fund. Social Security trust funds about 200 billion down 2034. Um, the trust fund is gone. In which case, benefits will be cut 20, 21 uh, percent. Medicare gets general revenues right now to sustain itself. Um, the single best thing you could do is get the economy cooking again because right now payroll tax revenue into FICA is is slower than it ought to be because we're only growing at at one percent growth. That's the slowest growth in the post World War II era. During the Reagan recovery, we were growing at five six percent growth. In fact, we had five straight quarters during the Reagan recovery of over 7% growth. We haven't even seen 3% under the policies that Angie supports here in the in the Obama administration. So I would focus 
on getting the economy going again so we can preserve these vital programs. So we have a you know, promise made, it's a promise kept, and we're going to keep them. But if you don't get the economy moving again, you're actually going to alter the trust fund imbalances and expedite them sooner. So economic growth is, is issue number one in this regard. And there was negative economic growth the day President Obama took office. Uh, look, uh, trust me, people listening to the Jason Lewis show for years and years know that I was very criti uh, critical of the Bush administration spending policies. And, right will, and that's, by the way, Tom, that is the thing here. When you're looking at who to support for Congress, you have to look at both scenarios, no matter who's elected president. Who do you want? Do you want someone that has been principled and put principle above party over the years? And I've had as many Republicans on uh, Matt at me on my radio show as Democrats? Or do you want somebody who's going to be a rubber stamp for Hillary Clinton? There is literally nothing that Hillary says that Angie Craig doesn't support. Right. And that, that is a, a serious consideration when you need a check in the legislative branch on the executive in this era of the imperial presidency. Right now, the cap on Social Security taxes, you are taxed into the Social Security Fund for your first $118,000 yep. of income. Do you support lifting that to a higher income level? The problem with that is if you double that, double the amount of revenue or earn earnings so for go the payroll to, tax, so you only to. solve 30% of the, of the deficit. It's not going to get you there. You can't go there that way. Plus, you're going to have a horrible disincentive to hire people and to go to work. I mean, when you tax employment, payroll tax, that does not do good things for the economy. Angie Craig, the question about Social Security and Medicare. Yeah, so uh, the flat tax that Jason seems to be in love with, actually, uh, is going to make us have to slash benefits for Social Security and raise the retirement age. I mean, you can call it looking for a solution, but if we implemented the flat tax that you talk lovingly about, it's going to add about uh, $3.6 trillion to our federal deficit, and we're going to have to make significant cuts. Look, I believe our promise to our seniors in this nation uh, is a sacred promise, and so I would never um, move the retirement age. I would look to uh, raise the cap. I would want to be very careful about I would consider raising the cap. I think what we need to take from this is in 1983, uh, when President Reagan was in office, uh, we had a Congress that actually worked with him. And so they came back with some proposals related to the extension of some of these benefits. And, you know, I am very, very conscious of making sure we don't raise taxes on the middle class. And so I would not want to bring the limit above uh, 118 up immediately. I would say, look, Keep it at 118, but when you hit 250, if you make more than 250, it picks back up. I just wouldn't want families in that gap to get caught uh, within. Well, what about cutting benefits? So that would be a payroll I, tax hike you're in favor of? An extent. Well, for people who make a quarter million dollars a year. We're, we're, what about cutting benefits? Uh, what I mean, that is considered a possibility of here with the, the precarious state. Social Security could be in. Do either of you support cutting benefits now with congressional action instead of waiting for the trust fund to be dried up? You can't go into a scenario where you've made a promise to people, they've worked all their lives, and then they get there and you have the rug pulled out from under them. I'm not in favor of that. I'm going to work with whoever's there in Congress, Republican or Democrat, to figure out a way to sustain Social Security and Medicare. Work very hard to do that. A uh, couple other comments here. Uh, well, let me just respond on the flat tax issue. because I think Do you that, support the flat tax? Yes, I do. And I think it's very important that you get a revenue neutral flat tax. Right now, we have a scenario where we have very high tax rates for small pass-through businesses in the second district. In fact, the federal rate for a, a non-C corp, subchapter S, uh, LLC, which I was basically, uh, is 39.6%. You throw in Mark Dayton's take, and it's another 10%. You're looking at 50%. You throw in payroll taxes, self-employment taxes, and you're actually approaching 60% on the next marginal income tax rate, the next marginal dollar earned. That is a huge disincentive to work. It is a ridiculously high rate. Now, if you're a General Electric, or if you're a hedge fund manager, or if you can lobby to get your industry out from under Obamacare taxes, why, this high tax rate, not a problem. You can get exempt from it. But if you're the average person in the second district, you can't. I, instead of high taxes where just some people pay them, I would prefer a lower flat rate tax that everybody pays. That is the epitome of fairness, and I don't know why anyone would oppose that. Would that be what's called rev revenue neutral to have a flat tax, or is the goal also to bring in less revenue for the for the No, federal you can government? make it revenue neutral. Art Laffer and a number of other people have come up with revenue neutral procedures, but I do believe we ought to take a, a look at the way we, the GAO and others account especially the CBO, actually, account for uh, these revenue projections. They do static analysis, which means economic growth is not included in the revenue projections. I happen to believe that's been proven.
proven wrong time and time again. You can get dynamic growth and you can get greater growth at lower rates, which by the way, Patrick Kennedy, when he voted first for the luxury tax back in the 90s, then realized it was killing the yacht industry and the boat industry in Rhode Island, voted to repeal it, said, well, when you have high tax rates, it discourages growth and you get less revenue. Something John F. Kennedy, his uncle, said in 1962 in, the, in his speech at the Democratic or Economic Club of New York, when he said it's a paradoxical truth that high rates bring in less revenue. Boy, those Democrats are long gone, I'm afraid. Well, Tom, the, the point is, though, that economists and and everyone knows a flat tax is not a reasonable proposal. It's never going to pass in this country. And why? Because it is an absolute windfall for the wealthy. Because along with a flat tax and a lower tax rate, you would lose all of your deductions, your mortgage interest deduction, your ability to deduct, deduct for uh, your charitable contributions. And so the only segment that uh, it's going to help is the absolute wealthy. Jason tends to value the wealthy more than others. He said that out <laughs> loud before. But turning to one thing, I actually agree with Jason on one big thing. Thing. And that is, we have got to accelerate growth in this economy. And and listen here, listen well, because this is not, you know, you're throwing me under the bus in terms of uh, ideas. I think we have got to reform corporate taxes in this country. I absolutely believe that the third highest corporate tax rate in the world is unsustainable from a competitive economic perspective. I also think that we need to allow companies to repatriate their foreign income back to the United States. And I would like to use this as an investment program for the U.S. Infrastructure investment, surface highway investment. I don't want to raise the gas taxes, as you, as you implied to the Republican uh, 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 Red Wing Republican Eagle the other day. What I want to do, after you sign the Norquist Pledge, by the way, uh, what I want to do is bring back those repatriated taxes, and I want to make companies, if they're willing to bring it back, invest in R&D, invest in infrastructure, and I want to use the dollars we create that we're never getting back because it's being invested overseas to allow the U.S. to invest in highways, bridges, roads, dams. Uh, rural broadband, these sorts of things. So I do agree that we've got uh, to accelerate the growth in this country. The other side well, of that, well, no one knows more about is, deductions and loopholes than you, Angie. You've been dealing in those for a number of years, and you're the richest person in this room. So if you want to talk about the wealthy, we can talk about that all day long. All I'm saying is a flat tax, if it's good enough for corporations. It ought to be good enough for small pass-through businesses and individuals. And with regard to infrastructure, that's an interesting point. Angie talks about building roads and bridges, and, th and then she supports diverting money, $6 billion last year in the Highway Trust Fund, to these boondoggles like the Southwest Light Rail, like Zip Rail, what like Wind Farms. What are you talking farms. about? I don't support any of that. You, so don't, you don't, I support don't support Southwest Zip Light Rail? You don't support Southwest Light I, Rail? I support infrastructure investment, and no, we're going to no, lose well, that uh, federal money do, if we don't take this. it. Right now, we're taking federal gas gas taxes, and we're diverting that money to a $1.9 billion boondoggle known as Southwest Light oh, Rail. Which, is, which is, by the way, just to clarify, an allowable step because right. it's paying for transit. I mean, but that's it's, what it's we're talking about. It's part of the about. mass transit account. That's right. right. I'm not saying it's illegal. I'm saying there's a mass transit account in the Highway Trust Fund that's diverting 17% of our gas tax dollars to those things. And I'm telling you flat out, right here, I oppose that. I will not support that in Congress. Angie will. So well, that's, what, so and and that's right. You're going to say no to economic development in Minnesota based on ideological principle. Okay, John Klein did the same thing when he said, nope, won't take earmarks. You know where those, the dollars, the federal dollars that should have been invested in the second all those years went? Some other states. So it's not really roads and bridges but, then, really. But is then it? is, it's, it's light rail projects. But I want to, but what, do you have any support for federal funding for public transit? For, of course I do. The Orange Line in our district is fine. Bus rapid transit is great. But a $1.9 billion rail scheme that would not be possible without that federal diversion that costs over $100 million per mile when we could add a lane to our 73-mile beltway for $11 million roughly per mile? That's total waste. It's total inefficiency. And that's why I'm telling you today I oppose Southwest Light Rail and those type programs. And there's another difference between Angie Craig and Jason Lewis. She supports those. The, I don't. The Tom, experts, by the way, will say that if you add a lane of traffic to the highway, it does not solve Well, I, I hear that a lot from, from usually from contractors and the lobbyists who are interested in building building light rail projects. But the fact is, you can't build your way out of congestion is the line. The fact is, you can't underbuild your way out of congestion either. Tom, I was about to say just a minute ago uh, that I have spent 22 years in the private sector creating jobs, 
growing businesses. That's absolutely true, Jason. A Fortune 500 company that was founded right here in the Twin Cities, one of the jewels, St. Jude Medical. But you've spent 25 years on the radio conservative talk radio promoting partisan politics. In fact, you helped lead to the rise. The dialogue that you led helped lead to the rise to uh, the Tea Party, the Freedom Caucus, the extreme group of lawmakers that you said so many times you want to join, and either you were lying then or you're lying now that you're not joining them. Um, and you helped create Donald Trump. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I know to you want to tie me, everybody to Donald to Trump. Call I get me that. a political uh, insider. Uh, Angie, when you spent you. 25 years on the radio doing first, this, first it's of all, ridiculous. Angie, it's, it's very demeaning and condescending to tell the listeners out there that unless you're in a corporate boardroom or a vice president at a company, you shouldn't be running for political office. Your, your vote doesn't count. I happen to think that a lot of people out there, welders and electricians and teachers and, and people that drive buses, you know what? They just mm. they have just much right to run for political office as you do. Can you just tell me when I said time. that, though? You implied that numerous oh. times last week and right now. Oh, that, Let me, oh well, okay. you, were on, you were just doing an everyday job and I was in the boardroom. Now, no, what you, no, no, what no. You were, doing you were the boardroom, creating the division we're seeing in America. You were doing today, in the boardroom that's what was very, you were doing. was very interesting Do because you, you were putting profits ahead of patients. Okay. You had multiple lawsuits against your company while you were I leading from the, the boardroom. I was the head of and HR you were charged, and on, corporate on. Overcharging veterans $4 million. You need to answer for that. What he's referring to, first of all, though, do you still support Donald Trump? A lot of Republicans in the last week have withdrawn their support here in Minnesota. Do you still support there, Donald Trump? Tom, you know, there is a problem with a, a presidential candidate who calls Catholics backward and ignorant. Presidential candidate who trades diplomacy for cash. Presidential candidate that calls half the voters deplorables. Presidential candidate who's, 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 you know, admits ISIS is funding Saudi Arabia, but then takes money. I get that. Oh, that's Hillary Clinton. I'm sorry. What about, uh, what about candidates who call willing, Mexicans? I am not willing to turn the country back to the Clintons. So you still support Donald I will Trump, vote for him. even though with all the the, the sexual assault tape with the, on the on the Access not, Hollywood Bush. I, the, I've got two daughters. That offends me as much as it offends anybody. Trust me. But for heaven's sakes, you've got the Clinton machine throwing stones in a glass house. I'm, I mean, why are we even talking about I, this? I'm I'm just embarrassed for you, Jason. Oh, thank I'm, you. I'm embarrassed thank you. I for you that. because nine allegations, more than nine allegations of sexual assault, mm -hmm. and now last night saying specifically uh, that he would not honor the will of the people in this election, that he would trade our democracy against the will of the people. I'm embarrassed for you. Exactly what Al Gore did in 2000 and what he was advised to do by the Democratic machine, including the Clintons, not concede the election in 2000. Were you embarrassed for well, those that, folks? That was then? on election night, Jason, when right, it was still that was close. After he the did election. concede the race. Yeah. And, right. You know, well, no, he didn't concede. He conceded it, and then he didn't concede it. Well, but he did after the recount and after the Supreme Court. Will, the question is, will you? I'm, of and course. Because you will honor the result of, of the election. Of course I will. You of course will, I will. That's Absolutely. not to say there's Had, not voter fraud. Thought, however had to get that out there They're, the 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 <laughs> comments i'm asking you about but the reason we're talking about this, Jason, is because at the top of the ticket, it has created consternation sure. for the Republican Party, and you're the Republican nominee. There are ads that you say uh, take audio from your radio show out of context. Well, let me just, hold on about the Trump thing, because it's very crucial. I mean, for instance, on eminent domain, I disagree with Donald Trump vehemently. I, my family went through that. So just because someone's on the same party doesn't mean you walk in lockstep with them. I'm going to fight Republicans and Democrats, whoever the president might be, uh, if I'm in Congress. This is the problem with Angie. She uh, disagrees with nothing of what Hillary Clinton says or what Nancy Pelosi says has been raising money for her. So if that's the rubber stamp you want, go right ahead. But there's only been one case in sexual harassment amongst recent politicians that's actually been settled. That's actually been settled. And that was... William Jefferson Clinton. You have so again, throwing stones in a glass house is is not going to work. You have also said that the ads that take the audio from your radio show, comments about women and comments about slavery, you, you have said those were taken out of context. Here's some time. How are they out of context? Well, not uh, I just said it. Two television stations who reviewed the ad said they were taken out of context and they were deliberately misleading. Now you've got a, a DCCC ad that pretends to p pawn off a normal voter, turns out to be a lobbyist in St. Paul. Um, this is the most misleading and duplicitous campaign in recent Minnesota 
Minnesota history. Now, I know Angie hasn't been here in Minnesota that long, but that's not the way we do politics here, and the ads aren't moving the needle. So if you're talking about you know whether we ought to have religious freedom, which is one of those monologues, and I believe that we ought to have religious freedom. I don't think government should dictate the moral conscience to Hobby Lobby or to Little Sisters of the Poor or to anyone. Uh, I believe in the First Amendment. Angie doesn't. She well, when thinks, you she say, thinks, well, let me finish yeah. the point. She, she thinks that, in fact, the government ought to dictate the, the religious beliefs of companies and, by the way, and of churches. She wrote long ago that she was very, very upset and was opposed to churches not giving their blessings based on their religious beliefs. That's a First Amendment issue. I can't believe she, she believes that, but apparently she does. So just let me just... Well, I have just, no idea what Jason's talking about, so we'll start there. But I, I'd well, like can, to comment because I, I do think that we need to have a conversation about the context of the ads. You keep whining about not a lot of context. You've said a lot of words. That's great. But <laughs> in the first ad, you called women ignorant. We put your words up on TV. They're your words. You said ignorant in the most generic way. I don't mean this to be a pejorative. Well, I mean, that is a pejorative, but okay. In the United States, this isn't about anything other than a woman's right to health care. In the United States, 98% of women have used contraception as part of both family planning and for other reasons. So the idea that a company or a religious institution can block access to health care for a woman, that's the policy Including issue abortion? that you're talking about. A religious about. institution should have to fund abortion then, partial birth abortion, because you see that we as a right. We're talking about that. We're talking about contraception. Okay. I'm, I'm in favor of contraception. Okay. Oh, I'm in favor of it. I think it ought to be over but the counter. Do, do you but have I'm to not, call women ignorant as no, you're talking about it? What, to me, what, it's just offensive, no, and it's not a leader. It, I don't it's not, think Angie, you're a leader. There's a reason. There's a reason. The independent observers are saying your ads are misleading. There's a reason the well, DCCC was misleading, and there's a reason you were on the wrong side of the Hobby Lobby decision, where the Supreme Court agreed with Jason Lewis, not Angie Craig. Well, but let me ask you this: I only have let thirty me, seconds, so let, if you want us to put everything you say up, I wish you'd take the well, ad. Let me just, just about let me, done that. let me get back to the to the root question, though, Jason, because the question, and you have said it's taken out of context. When there is a comment and a quote from your radio show that says the women are non thinking you have a mm -hmm. vast majority of young single women who couldn't explain to you what gdp means you know what they care about they care about abortion they care about abortion and gay marriage they care about the view they are non-thinking what was in your heart when you said that what did you mean by i that? said the same thing if you play you know angie just said a moment ago and this is a hoot that well my words on obamacare were taken out of context and then uh, she says well jason your words weren't taken out of context if you listen to the whole monologue all right, <laughs> over my career, and certainly in that debate about Hobby Lobby, I said the same thing about liberal men, supporting what I thought was unconstitutional. I don't think they've thought things through if you're mandating to churches that they've got to fund partial birth abortion, for crying out loud. That is a cornerstone of our First Amendment, religious liberty. I don't know how anyone could argue otherwise. We're talking this hour with the two uh, candidates, the Republican and DFL nominees for 2nd Congressional District, Jason Lewis, who you just heard is the Republican nominee, Angie Craig is the DFL nominee, and we are talking this hour about all of uh, all the topics, all the things. Uh, I have a question. We did invite some questions from people in our Public Insight Network, from listeners, and Brian in Northfield, Northfield is in the 2nd Congressional District, asks this, uh, maybe to take it down a notch here. What steps would you take on your first in your first month of office to reach out to members of Congress of other political parties to help reduce gridlock? Angie, I think you're, it's your turn to go first. Well, look, I've said that there are a number of common ground issues that I've, I've identified throughout the course of this campaign. Uh, the first is uh, the college debt crisis we're facing today. College affordability is a big issue. I, I know I would not be sitting here today running for Congress if I had not had access to affordable college. Because when you grow up in a trailer park, it is not automatic that you're going to get there. And my view is that we have created a situation in this country where 
too many kids and too many families aren't getting a fair shot anymore. So, so, so let me college just, debt yep, let me, is one big one. And what is it? How what is it you do in the first month? Al Franken has the hot dish contest, so you can't sure. have that. But yeah. what is it you do as if we're gonna take college debt, for example, what do you do to reach out so that you reduce yeah. that grid line? Well, you, you talk to people. Uh, you talk to people and you figure out where can we find common ground on reducing the enormous cost of college debt to students that's costing our economy. These kids aren't buying houses. They're not uh, They're not having children. I've met so many young people who really, really are struggling. And so I'd work with Republicans to figure out, you know, can we work together to reduce the interest rate, the In the Red Act that uh, – uh, Duckworth is sponsored in the House. Uh, I would work with them to say, can we work together on this opioid crisis? Um, you know, I know this is a issue that Eric Paulson's worked on. Uh, I would love to be the Democratic counterpoint to uh, Congressman Emmer on the topic of trade with Cuba. So I would talk to them, get to know them work with them, and frankly, figure out how we get things done together. The problem with Jason is that <laughs> he says no to everything. He just says no. If it contains any ideological issue with sort of his frame of reference, he just says no. He actually said no. He would not have supported uh, the budget last year because it was a compromise budget. He says out loud, I don't, it makes me nervous when politicians start to compromise. I kind of like gridlock. These are quotes from Jason over the years. So he says he wants to put his words in action. The, I don't think we need more of that the, in Washington. Yeah, it's, and, and it's the spirit astounding, of the, well, it's astounding to hear someone who got the endorsement from the Progressive Caucus, a band of the most radical 70 members of Congress led by a socialist, Bernie Sanders, along with Keith Ellison, who have no plans to compromise on anything. They're calling for a $6.6 trillion tax hike over the next 10 years. They're in favor of the Clean Power Plan, a $500 billion cap in tax. Uh, they're in favor of a carbon tax. She got their endorsement, and she said she was humbled and gratified. That doesn't sound like someone's going to reach across the aisle. But if you want some place where I'll reach across the aisle, I'll give it to you right now. Um, carried interest for hedge fund managers. And my apologies to Mitt Romney. But the idea that carried interest is, is a capital gain is silly. It's ordinary income, and that's part of reforming the tax code so that those people would have to pay ordinary income tax rates so everybody, everybody else could pay a little less. That's how you reach across. And I would push hard for the normal appropriations process so that people have to work together and there aren't these never-ending continuing resolutions and omnibus bills. Tom, One can big, I just big, say that uh, I'm reaching across the aisle because I'd work to eliminate carried interest for hedge fund managers too, Jason. Let me, let me big picture though, I think the spirit of that question, and I'm asking both of you this, and I'll start with you this time, Jason, the spirit of that question comes from uh, what I sense is a frustration with drawing any lines in the sand to say that I won't compromise on this, that, and the other thing is part of the frustration of Washington, D.C. Uh, and so... Is it right to say that there are, uh, that's a non well, let me challenge you know what you, I let mean? Let me challenge you there a little bit. There is a frustration of gridlock and not getting anything done and, and just things staying the same. But there's also a frustration on going along to get along. And that's why we have a $20 trillion, $19.5 trillion debt, which, by the way, isn't even mentioned on Angie's website. We're sitting here with $500 billion a year in net interest payments. We have a 10-year Treasury rate that's below 2% when the average post-World War II 10-year Treasury was at 5.7%. If those interest rates ever spike back to something close to their normal range, we will have interest on the debt over a trillion dollars, and we will have a run on the dollar. This is an existential crisis for the health of the economy. Admiral Mullen said the single biggest national security threat is our debt. She doesn't even put it on her website. The reason I was opposed to un doing the budget caps of 2011 is we were finally having across the board spending cuts to address this. We undid them. What's happened the last year? Our deficits shot up to $600 billion this year. So you know what? I'm going to work for budget caps. I believe the debt's serious. I believe it's going to give our children tax rates of 75%. You're darn right I'm not in favor of that. Do and that's you, what I'll fight for. When you support budget cuts, is, is across the board the way to go? Or do you support specific, maybe eliminating departments? We've talked about that. Do you support whatever? Where do you cut funding yes. and spending in the budget? I think you do have to take a look at things across the board. Because you know and I know, and everybody knows, that what happens is Democrats go to Washington and they propose budget cuts to Republicans. Republican programs. Republicans go to Washington and they propose budget cuts to Democrat programs. When they both realize they don't like that, they get together behind closed doors and they say, I'll tell you what, I'll fund yours if you fund mine. And that's why we've got a $19.5 trillion debt. Well, I, I think that's a lazy 
person's way of running the government. If you can't prioritize your investments and work with people, I think that's pretty lazy. So what I would say is a lot of people agree that the sequester cuts, uh, particularly the Department of Defense, uh, Homeland Security, uh, have said out loud that the sequester cuts leave the world a less safe place. And so I would not support sequester budget cuts. I think that if we send the right people to Washington, we can actually figure out how do we prioritize things. And Jason... Angie, uh, yeah, we've been hearing that we, for we 30 threw years, in just and a we've second. got a debt Well, just a minute just ago, control. Jason talked about uh, the Progressive Caucus, so I just want to address that. I've also been uh, endorsed by about 150 other organizations, uh, including the New Democratic Coalition, uh, which is a group of uh, uh, pro-growth and uh, uh, strong national security Democrats. So what I would say is I appreciate the progressive caucuses, uh, socially progressive agenda, but the $6.6 trillion budget that Jason keeps talking about, I don't support. I've never supported. We can't afford it. And finally, because you wanted to see it on my website, I'm uh, happy to share it with you today. Uh, look, I think there are about six or seven things that we can cut uh, really almost a trillion dollars. And when you think about there are the carried interest loophole that's one thing you mentioned it oil well, that's subsidies not a budget cut angie oh I, i'm talking about the deficit oil subsidies we're talking about uh executive pay loopholes stock option loopholes immigration reform which also would grow gdp and so all of these things and and your point is well taken jason on there are 200 programs that the congressional budget office has estimated that we can run much more efficiently i've actually done that jason you keep saying we need someone in congress who's actually run a business i've done that you ran a virtual social media <laughs> company there, that has and, uh, you know instead of and there's, bitcoins and there's a reason coins. and there's a reason you and you didn't even and, do that well and you, there's a reason you weren't endorsed by the national federation of independent business and i was because your tax and spending plans are going to sentence our kids to a lifetime of debt. You're not willing to take the tough choices on budget sequestration, which, by the way, was 2.5% of the total federal budget. $200 billion out of $4.1 trillion. Now, I don't know. Call me skeptical, but I think most federal agencies could save 2.5%. And Could've experts not. said it would hurt national defense and homeland security. And those another, experts gave us a trillion-dollar debt. Another topic here, as we are in our last uh, minutes here with this conversation with Jason Lewis and Angie Craig, the Republican and DFL nominee uh, nominees for the 2nd Congressional District, which is the South Metro into southeastern Minnesota, the only open seat in Congress for the Minnesota delegation this year. John Klein is retiring. Is climate change real, and how do you address it, Angie Craig? Well, I'm happy to let Jason talk first so he can explain to you why he doesn't believe the 97% of climate scientists who say it's real. Absolutely, it's real. Farmers know it's real. Uh, Jason's not so sure that it's real. Uh, we have to uh, address it as part of the Paris Climate Agreement. Part of that is the Clean Power Plan, which I am concerned about the interim targets for and whether some of our uh, uh, facilities can meet those interim targets. So, look, I worked under uh, in a business that was under federal regulation, the Food and Drug Administration, for 22 years. So I understand that when you have a, a big federal regulation that you need to make sure you give business the time it needs to comply with it. But, you know, the question is, uh, do we want to address it? And you got to actually admit it exists, Jason, before uh, you even think about addressing it. Well, first you said I didn't think it existed. Then you said I wasn't certain. Well, you said so, that on so Friday. It? So, it, so clarify, it, it's Jason. not man-made. I, I, I will be glad to clarify. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, do I think the planet has warmed since post-World War II and greenhouse gases have gone up? Sure it has. But we've had a pause for the last 15 years, and the climate models can't explain that. But I would quote none other than every Democrat's favorite businessman, Warren Buffett, who happens to know a little bit about insurance and insures uh, P&I all over the country. And he said, not recently, in fact, a number of times, that, I'm sorry, uh, if you're worried about climate change has an insurance problem, you don't need to worry. I haven't seen excess claims for any of it related. He actually got criticized by the Democrats for basically saying he didn't think it was a serious problem. Well, now, he, well it, he, he also said in that statement, it would be foolish for me or anyone to demand 100% proof of a huge forthcoming damage to the world if that outcome seemed at all possible, at all possible, and if prompt action had even a small chance of thwarting the danger. That was the same statement in which he talked about the insurance. Exactly, rates. and that's the insurance industry and pooling risk and pricing risk. And so far, he hasn't priced the risk. 
And so if you're not pricing the risk, you're not counting on a calamity. And that was the point of his entire uh, uh, speech there, and that's why the Democrats were coming down on him so hard. He says he has not seen increased claims due to climate, period. If, if there's only a 1% chance the planet is heading toward a truly major disaster and delay means passing a point of no return, inaction now is foolhardy. That's, a, that's an anti-climate change statement. That was in the same then, statement. Then why isn't he raising his insurance rates? I Berkshire, don't. Let, let me finish. I, the, whole, the point here on the clean power plan is it was A, rejected by the Supreme Court for being yet another um, imperial president overreaching by the executive branch. I think branch. it's currently in litigation, uh, but okay. It, it, you know, it was put on hold by the Supreme Court. Correct. And indeed, because the president overreached and the, and the lower court said it was a cap in tax that had to originate from the Congress. And in fact, in fact, it would be a cap in tax of about $500 billion. Now, the question in this cost-benefit analysis, which we have to look at in all uh, environmental uh, uh, regulations, is, is it worth it? Is it worth lowering Celsius half a degree over the next hundred years, half a degree temperature, all for five hundred billion dollars? That was something I would certainly be glad to, to to look at. But I would I would refer everybody to read uh, Stephen Breyer's book before he uh, was elevated to the Supreme Court on breaking the vicious cycle. Um, he he wrote basically a cost benefit trade off, pretty darn good book. We only have a few minutes left, so I have to get in my Ken Bone question that's related to this. What energy <laughs> policy? What energy policy change do you support at the federal level, Jason? I'll let you go first. Well, look, I, I do think the federal government should not be in the business of pushing T. Boone Pickens and big corporate wind farms on the citizens of Goodhue and Wabashaw County. Uh, the state of Minnesota, along with the big interests, were trying to push that. And thanks to a few brave citizens in Goodhue and Wabashaw, they stood up to that and said, no, even though you're going to get subsidized, even though you're going to take thousands of acres of agricultural land out of production in Goodhue and Wabashaw, the citizens said no. So that is one area of energy policy I would not be pushing. So you don't support wind energy? I, I don't support it in Good you county when it's forced on people who don't want it absolutely not angie so i believe that uh, we need an all of the above energy strategy uh, but that uh, we need to f move ourselves to more renewable energy uh, i think that uh, what's happening to our climate is real uh, i believe the 97 percent of t scientists who tell me that uh, jason says i don't know well if you're not going to listen to other people when they talk about funding defense, funding homeland security, what's happening to our climate? And the national debt? I and the national debt, which well, I just gave you six examples and corporate tax reform <laughs> and repatriation of income. So you can go ahead and try to connect me to whoever you want to connect me to. But at the end of the day, I'm going to do what I believe is right for Minnesota families. And I believe that uh, keeping our children's uh, air and water safe is very important to Minnesota families. Well, I certainly believe in clean air and clean water. I also believe in keeping Minnesotans safe, which is why I don't support letting in uh, another 110,000 refugees, many of whom Syrian refugees that this administration has said are infused with ISIS. Angie said she wanted to run so she could fully fund the president's amnesty order. That was one of the reasons she gave why she wanted to run in the second district. So she believes in that unconstitutional order to and open borders has does of course Hillary Clinton so yeah I, I want to keep Minnesota safe too the refugee process is so long and arduous really I'm glad you brought that up. We only have a minute, Jason. Well, I'm glad you brought oh, that up because respond. with so the WikiLeaks seconds. emails, we now know that none other than the Secretary of State said, I admit that many of these refugees are unvettable. That was in the email. There's no such thing as an unvettable well, then refugee. Talk to because Hillary. Because two-year process, uh, we either vet them and make sure that they are going to do no harm to us or we don't let them in. It's it's just that simple. And by the way, 25 Syrian refugees have been processed into Minnesota this year. And as a nation, we've got to keep our citizens stay safe and we've got to stay true to our values. We have to leave it there, unfortunately. We're at the end of the hour, but certainly everyone listening, November 8th is the election. You can vote now in Minnesota. Early voting is open. Go to mnvotes.org for information on that or show up on Election Day. You can register day of as well. There's instructions on how to do that at mnvotes.org. Angie Craig, the DFL nominee in the 2nd Congressional District, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And Jason Lewis, the Republican nominee, I appreciate it. Tom, good to see you. This is NPR News.